on the money, and I like to be very punctual, so let's go ahead and start the class. And I'll start with an introduction so that as people uh, trickle in that they won't miss any of your amazing playing. But um, the big thing for today, guys, is that we have Jeremy Smith with us. Jeremy Smith is a world percussionist, a multi-percussionist, an orchestral soloist, a Juilliard grad, uh, an internationally touring musician, a Broadway musician, an off-Broadway musician. Um, he's done about everything you can think of, and I've only just gotten started in the things that I've listed here. But if you want to check out his full bio, it's on his artist page on the percussionconservatory.com backslash Jeremy Smith. And uh, you can find out more about him there, and, and this stream will be going directly into his artist channel after this. So if you're watching this uh, on Facebook and you want to check it out again later, or if you're watching this in the webinar, you want to see some more after the class, you want to watch it again, it will be in his artist stream. Everyone who's watching on the webinar has the ability down at the bottom of your screen to participate in this class by using the chat, or you can raise your hand or do a question and answer. And Jeremy will be sure to get to these questions at the end of his master class and clinic. As he, was just as he was just discussing, today he's going to be talking all about shakers and uh, specifically how to get you sounding great on them. And also at the question and answer, I'm going to ask him some specific questions for our classical audience um, about how to incorporate great shaker playing into the orchestra. So without further ado, Jeremy, thank you so much for joining us and for being here. It is a huge honor to have you as our first masterclass guest artist on the stream. It's just, it's amazing that, you know, you and I have known each other for some number of years now, went to school together, have been colleagues together, have done a lot of stuff. So this is just the natural next step uh, to, to have you be our first artist on board. And let's, let's do it. How to play Shakers in the Orchestra with Jeremy Smith. Thanks for being here, man. Thanks, Josh. I love that. Um, yeah, it's a special moment. It's really cool. Um, so thanks uh, for everyone that's watching. And um, I was saying earlier before some of you got here, um, when I was kind of taking last minute thoughts and notes about uh, what I was on my mind and what I thought was uh, what I wanted to give about Shakers, which is an instrument that um, I've actually spent a lot of time on um, in various forms, um, whether it's kashishi or maracas or just the standard shakers, which we're going to talk mostly about. I'm going to hopefully save some time for kashishi and maracas specifically, just a couple of like quick, here's what you need to know kind of thing. Um, but I wanted to spend a lot of time just with the standard tubular shaker and how to do it from level zero. So the first uh, thing is something I learned from my teacher uh, at Juilliard, Gordon Gottlieb, which this thing, if I showed you this now and you didn't know it before, then we could just stop the class and it would be worth your time. And I would feel fine with that because that's how much value this was. And that is picking up the shaker with no extra noise that we don't want. So as a musical sound maker, we always want to be in control of all of the sounds we make. And obviously that is musical sounds, but also sounds that our instrument makes by themselves that maybe we need to control. So whether that's a resonating cymbal or a drum or things like shakers, which have beads inside them and they're falling on running around all over the place. So we need to learn how to control that. So the first thing is picking it up with no sound. And it's very simple, but uh, I want to offer to pick it up with your other hand. So if it's on a table, I don't have a table here, but say that it's on a table. I'm going to pick it up with my other hand, lift it up. And then in this position, back here, which I'll talk about in a second. Now you can even see with these shakers that I made, which again, I'm going to talk about, you can see that the beads are not at an angle ready to fall, but they're set, they're set um, parallel to the ground. Um, and I can move here without making any noise. So again, this position is really important. There's two, there's kind of three positions that we're going to be working with this thing 
and then one with a totally kind of neutral wrist, and then that out like this. Um, so when you pick up the shaker with the other hand silently, put it towards you, it's almost towards, it, pretty close to my face, and then I'm grabbing it this way. So, like I said, even just that uh, was a revelation to me as far as the intentionality of controlling our instruments sounds, right? So we don't get like just a, okay, I want to play the shaker, you know, um, we want to have a clean first note as well. So that is the next step. We're going to learn how to play isolated notes, first of all, and these are going to also be our accented notes. So we're in this position which will also later be our back accent kind of position with our, with our arm and our wrist kind of facing towards your face. From here, in order to play one note, we want to go straight there instead of back first, because I'm already back here. Instead of holding the shaker here and then going All right, we want to get that clean first note. That's why, again, this position. And then I'm going to go like that. And also notice that it's not totally straight. I think, I, even myself, sometimes I imagine shaker playing as like forward and back, which it totally can be if you want like a legato sound. And we're going to intentionally talk about that in a second. Uh, but for this first isolated single note, if you just had one note to play, um, this is a good position. And then it's actually going to be, we're going to work with gravity and kind of go diagonally down a little bit, kind of arc down this way. Let's see if I can get a first uh, clean one. Not perfect, but uh, you get the idea. So that was better. And again, now you see that I didn't plan this, but this is great that you can see the beads inside that they're totally flat. And that's what I want to aim for when I'm going down. I want to feel, feel the beads inside that they just kind of go like this and that there's no wave going down that it just goes from here down as clean of a sound as possible. And then now you notice I'm in this position, which is our forward accent position. So again, we have here, here with the neutral wrist, and then here. So we're starting here and going, kind of falling down like that. Then for the isolated note uh, backwards, it's a similar thing. I'm going to go up the arc and kind of land down like this. That's a little trickier, but satisfying when you can do it. I'm kind of lifting. I'm kind of lifting and landing down in this curved wrist position. Working with gravity the best I can. So those are the isolated notes. Um, let me know in the comments if uh, you have any questions about that later. So the isolated notes are also our accent notes. So um, let's talk about, and I talked about the positions, let's talk about this neutral, uh, it's also a legato 16th notes, but I was just gonna go sh 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 with no accents. Uh, if I wanted like a smooth sound, I would go in this neutral position and just use my arm, elbow like this. And that way, it is more just parallel to the floor. Uh, during this, I'm not articulating my wrist. Those are for accents, generally. Of course, there's always exceptions, you know, depending on the sound you want, how you want to move. But for being, for trying to control all the variables at the moment, uh, my wrist is stabilized. I'm getting that nice, smooth, kind of legato. So, in order to build accent patterns, um, just so I don't have to stand on my toes, I'm gonna. 
in order to build accent patterns, so again, this position is going to be our accent position, and this position is going to be our accent position this way. In the middle, we're going to try and reset whenever we can to this sort of neutral So for the accent, when I go, again, I want to think of the accent as, I want to use gravity, so I'm going to go down a little bit, neutral here, and then for the accent, I can go down, because that's going to help me a little bit with gravity, and it's going to drop the beads, almost like this, if I were to go like that. That's kind of what you want to happen in inside, um, and then kind of freezing down at the bottom, so you don't get, like, a long sound you want a very crisp sound so here we are these even neutral notes legato notes and for the accent that's when I articulate my wrist out this way and again a little bit down too so in order to prevent we want the most control we can. So if you had to just play one accent followed by no other accents, when you accent in this wrist articulation, the following notes, if you go back with the wrist, then you'll, that's when you're probably going to get that half unaccented, accented, unclear sort of thing. So when I go forward with the accent, the, the last, the notes following that are also a little bit of articulation of, of this uh, motion. And then I kind of slowly find my way back. So watch, watch this wrist action here. So it kind of goes out and then slowly back to, to neutral. Snap and then slowly back. Again, otherwise, you might get that. That, 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 that. Um, so speaking of accents back to back, uh, actually, no, I should do the towards, towards your face accent, uh, for lack of better terminology. Uh, and again, that is this position. So this is going to be our articulation in our wrist here to get the accent. Same thing is I don't want to follow it by going right back because that's going to give me an un unwanted accent. Uh, I float here for a little bit and then slowly go back to neutral. So I'll do it here. And what was also, again, I'm playing with gravity and trying to let it help me. That's why I'm, when I'm an accent, I go up a little bit and then I kind of rest down here and then I go up and then down. Just again, to sort of help get that contrast of sound with the accent and the unaccented. So if I were gonna do a pattern like again, just what we're talking about here is paying attention to this wrist articulation. I just realized, by the way, I didn't talk about grip, how to hold it. Let me talk about that really briefly. It's not very complicated, but important. I hold it, I think usually, depending on the weight of the shaker, some you might have to really grab with your whole hand, but for a sort of medium-sized general shaker like this, this seems to fit my, my hand well, just with two fingers. These guys are just chilling down here and then the thumb right in the middle. Um, as opposed to like deeper in the hand like this, um, I get more control when it's on the fingertips. I get more, uh, I can th throw it more on the fingertips. So um, accent patterns. Let's try this angle now, why not? Um, 
So see, I'm kind of going not just back and forth. So that's how I'm controlling those accents. And I'm not, um, again, just like I was just saying, when you play the accent, stay there and then come back slowly. Ba. Ba. Right. So. Accents in groups of three, same thing, just a little bit less time to regroup. So that especially is I'm going ba, 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 mm, mm, mm. Hope that's pretty clear. What is next? Loud and staccato. So if I were gonna do all accented notes, da 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 da. Um, I remember Josh playing uh, maracas in uh, Music for 18 Musicians when we were in school. It's just this the whole time. And so that is, um, you think of it like with this kind of vocabulary that we're, we've built so far, um, you can think of it as all accented strokes. So um, I'm going to go back and forth between this and this. with my arm obviously so really i'm going ba 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 but it's with my arm so it doesn't really look like i'm doing much of that but i am articulating to get that dry flat against the with the beads um so again my arm is really stable Something that helps again is playing with gravity. So it's not, I, I can do it totally parallel. Although actually that feels incorrect actually. So I'm gonna go with what I said earlier and, and use this angle. So I'm, I'm using gravity to, to my advantage. It's almost an up down. Um, it's a, kind of on a diagonal. So, and you kind of have to get used to the feel of the beads inside, kind of spending not too much time up there and letting them fall before you go back. So it is a little bit of a perpetual motion. You want to keep that momentum going. Now you can do that slow. It takes uh, a little bit of gravity uh, control, but let me show you. I'm articulating into my wrist a little bit, but the main thing I'm doing is following the the, the beads uh, with with gravity. So up here, I'm kind of catching it like we did in the beginning. Is our our um, remember when we picked it up here? It's that position, and it's again just kind of a lift up, so I can so that I can go down. Uh, let me know if you want uh, more details about that in the questions. Let's move on. Accents of group of threes, different feels. Um, let's talk about adding space first. So if I had to play, um, string of 16th notes with some eighth note spaces, for example, these kind of things um i was just before the pandemic started i was uh subbing in uh tina the tina musical on broadway and i think the pattern i remember was um
something like that. And so that is a whole different, a whole next next level of controlling space both ways. So we're going to talk about that. So how I add that space, whether I want an accent, if I want an accent, then again, I, I can add articulation to my wrist and add that downward weight. Um, but I don't have to have an accent. I can just stop. Just as a, it's a clean stop, I'm, I, there's control in my arm. I still have this neutral position if I don't want an accent. Um, but just making sure it's a clean stop. Then getting used to getting comfortable with this direction. A lot of people are really comfortable with out, 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 out. And they neglect the this motion. So another hint is to practice a lot this so um you know it's kind of like just practicing things left-handed lead on the snare drum it's just it's just good to kind of address that eventually you know every once in a while so every once in a while just practice shaker patterns starting this way so one two three four this kind of thing and again we're adding space now so This is a really useful pattern. Notice I'm not doing any accents. So again, if we want to add accents, dot, 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 articulate, boom, boom, boom. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but again, those inner notes, my wrist isn't moving back around. I'm Accenting, staying there, and then accent, stay there, accent, stay there, accent, stay there. What I'm doing right now is a little bit exaggerated, but that's, that's what's happening. Actually, that, that was the Tina pattern. It just came out. Um, okay. Accents, adding space. Let's talk about um, common rhythm, like uh, common embellishment, like um, we'll, we're going to talk about on the maracas in a little bit. But that, digga digga, that, 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 digga digga, that, 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 this kind of bolero thing. Um, it's the same thing. We're going to use um, the same, same mechanism. Uh, combination of you know wrist and then my arm moving precisely um, here's another here's another one is um, I'm just trying to think of kind of alternate uh, situations a single note after a string of string of notes so if I had to play Da, 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 da. Uh, how do I play? There's a couple ways I can do what we did before, which is go back. I'm going to do that. And then I'm, if I have to put the shaker down, I would grab it with my other hand and set it down like this. So ba, 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 I can do. There's another way you can also do you can follow gravity one more time and go down another time. So that is this thing that I did earlier. That kind of thing is what, what the beads are going to be doing inside. So your arm has to move really fast and then you're going to catch the beads. That wasn't a good one like that. It's not the easiest shaker to, to do this. Let me see. So that kind of thing. Yeah, the tricky thing is to not get da da. 
and it, we want to just move really fast down and then stop. That was a good one. So I want to beat the beads before they reach the top. Um, one more thing, uh, two more things. Switching hands. Uh, this is a thing definitely in orchestra that is probably going to be a nice um, tip. We're often doing many things. We have to grab the mallets while we're playing the thing and the chime beaters are over there and um, all that stuff. So switching hands can come in handy, uh, especially if you're in a tight, uh, tight amount of time musically and you have to grab something really quick. Maybe you meant to grab it with your right hand, but you know, you had to grab it with your left. Starting here. Think slow, take your time, breathe, and kind of join your left hand um, rather than trying to like do this kind of thing. The easy transfer is like preparing up here and almost start to move already. Then you can hold. So see how I'm, I raise my hand, I start to move first, and then make the switch, rather than, right? Raise my hand, there. That's a good one. Another thing I thought of is um, if the shaker is standing upright, how to start playing um, if the shaker is upright. And it's a similar sort of thing. You can pick it up like this, and instead of going and then playing, you can kind of make that first motion one whole preparation. So if I'm, uh, again, maybe not ideally, if I accidentally put the shaker, you know, maybe not the way I want it, if it's on its on its side like this I can grab it and I can get in this position almost like it's the same thing as like what we did in the beginning here but if it's if it's faced this way I can just sort of make the one big motion so and you just make it as quick as you can again aiming for that first articulate stroke down there at the bottom so I just kind of go not ideal, like I was saying, but that's just the best we can do to not go zha, 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 or making, you know, that sort of uh, situating ourselves sound. Um, you know, that in, in the orchestra may not matter, but it might, you know, depending on your hall, especially in a studio situation, if it's a live studio situation. Um, or chamber music when there's, you know, maybe you're playing with two string players and you're very exposed. Um, these sort of things really matter. So um, I need to talk about different feels really quick. Um, there's, what can I say? Um, I would say a common, common swing as far as a pop feel. It's really common. Um, this kind of thing, like think of being thinking like a singer songwriter guitar it's subtle but it's a little bit swung so instead of that 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 I'll also mention this is a great time especially in the genre I just mentioned like a singer songwriter sort of thing um, even in orchestra too, again, you always want to be listening to what the appropriate texture is in the moment. Um, and it might not be that, 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 especially in a pop situation or something like that. Maybe you want that sort of loose, and in that case, I'm literally just letting letting my wrist loose i'm just kind of moving my arm with whatever rhythm that i want I just kind of loosen up um i wish i could be more specific at that time at this time but um for now yeah just 
sometimes you want that zaza 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 and you can accent you can sort of mid accent with this arm neutral wrist legato stroke and then get that sharp accent again with the wrist so Um, also in Tina show, there was a really tricky spot where I did all of these things that I'm saying I had to, I think it played timpani really quick. And then there was a quick transition and I had to throw the mallets down, pick the shaker up really quick with my other hand like this and join the guitar player playing this sort of but he was really swinging it. And so it's really tricky to So just then I was doing one accent and then I was doing ga 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 um, And that all comes again from this kind of control, the relationship between this articulation and then this movement. Um, speaking of, um, it, it fortunately it's all the same really, uh, the same mechanics depending if your shaker is this big or a tiny little egg shaker like this. Um, you just have to get yourself oriented and see how it feels. Uh, there's also different weights as well. We'll talk about that in a second. But um, notice it's the same grip. These two fingers, my thumb in the back. Um, again, like this uh, to me is a little clumsy feeling. I like this nimble sort of feeling with the two, two fingers here. Um, yeah, speaking of other shakers, uh, this is a beast. Um, this one inside is metal shot, like from, from a shotgun. Um, yeah, I think it's copper. It's really heavy and with a very solid, very, very solid plastic. It's really loud. I'll stand back, but... So just make sure if you get a shaker part to really play with the instruments beforehand because they can all be different, different weights, different sizes. Um, this one is also really smooth on the inside. So that actually makes things difficult sometimes because you, you get things rolling around inside that is hard to control. So that makes even more, I have to really work on articulating with the with the wrist and really controlling that um, I think now we can talk about some Morocco stuff how are we doing on on everything Josh how are we doing on time oh I can't hear you it's okay doing uh, how about now good yep Doing absolutely great. Um, yeah, that that's fantastic. Uh, how about um, since you're switching to Mar since you're switching to maracas, uh, we have a couple questions here about shakers. Yeah. Uh, if you pop that open, th you can see in the Q and A, Jeremy. If you want to read oh. yourself, um, but I'll go ahead and read the question to you. But if you want to read along, the first one was: Do we have shaker handles or stands in the market where the shakers could be placed? during a performance to prevent unnecessary sound. So maybe like some sort of mount or a stand or have you seen anything like this? Yes, um, the Minel shaker holder is actually pretty great. Um, also another tip, I use it mostly actually just to hold a, a single stick, um, but it's, it's a great adjustable little cradle for the shaker. Um, and then yes, my tip for that would be um, if you can, uh, for example, if you were in a really tight situation, again, musically, uh, I mean, or spaciously, I guess, but uh, if you were able to mount it around this height, right? Because then you can just grab it from the cradle like this, and then you're ready to go. Uh, rather than if you have to pick it up, then it sort of defeats the purpose. 
Um, so if, yeah, if you're able to mount that Minel shaker holder at eye level, super slick. Awesome. And then um, the other question that we have here is, it seems like you made your own shaker. Could you share how you made it? Yes. Oh, right. That's one of the advertised subjects of the class. <laughs> yes. Um, this one is great because uh, it reveals what <laughs> the container is. These are just prescription bottles. Um, I think, I don't know if uh, you can do this anymore, but we just, this was years ago in my hometown. We went through the drive through and we we're just like, hey, do you have bottles that you're going to throw away? And they were like, oh, uh, yeah, I guess. So they just gave me like six or seven or eight of these and I uh, made some shakers. Ideally, um, that's a flat top so that you can glue two of them together. Um, and then I just put some gaff tape on here to just make it look nice. But you see, these are just orange prescription bottles. Um, they're pretty strong. Um, they haven't broken on me and honestly, this is why I was going to talk about it in this class. It's really, really worth your time because uh, I have made this shaker. Yeah, this one. And then this model, the light model, which sounds super silky. Honestly, I've not needed any other shakers ever to, to, for my personal uh, work and my personal taste that has covered me for years. So, uh, I recommend that. And these are a great sound, uh, is glass beads, glass. Um, for example, I don't know if you can hear the difference, but these are plastic. And then these are the glass ones. just a more sharp crisp sound of the glass um, prescription bottles glass beads um, experiment with your own weights uh, as far as how much you put in it's really roughly speaking it's about halfway is, is nice um, just so they if they were flat they're a little bit so if it was up here that would be too much and you wouldn't be able to get a really strong sound. So if it's kind of a little bit below half here and about, it's about up here, I think halfway. Uh, last tip about the glass beads. Uh, the next time I go, I'm going to get different ones. These work. The thicker one works great. This light shaker, these, they have some kind of, coating on it or it's some sort of shiny coating and it they stick together it's like static electricity and so i actually had to put some dryer sheets inside to get get rid of this the uh, them like sticking together on the sides with the plastic of the thing so get glass beads that are with no coating or coloring as as little of that as possible and the sizes the sizes, uh, I think the small ones here are either a 12 or a 13. They, there's this number system with sizes of glass beads. Um, it's just like, it's like six, eight, ten, you know, and then it goes up. Um, I don't know what the numbers mean. Maybe it cor correlates to millimeters or something, but these are a size 12 or 13, really small. It's like tiny, tiny, but it's perfect for this sort of light, soft sound and this is the sound for me i use by far the most um if i want a little more kind of shaker a vibe dance i use a lot of this one of my dance classes that kind of stuff but for pop stuff really clean tight sound i love the light and again that's like a size 12 or 13 beat awesome uh that is super super helpful so does anyone else have questions for Jeremy about shakers? Because, uh, again, you can ask them at the end of the class, but he's about to move on now to maracas. So I just want to remind everyone that at the bottom of your panel, you should have the ability 
to uh, do a question or answer, which is where you can directly ask Jeremy a question. So there should be a function there for you that says Q and A. And you can also raise your hand uh, so that we know that you are trying to tell us something if for whatever reason we can't reach you. And then also we have the chat there. So it, it, any of these options are great, but if you specifically wanna ask Jeremy a question, go ahead and drop that in the Q&A. You can either include your name or keep it anonymous, so it's totally up to you. Um, but if, if no further questions, then we'll go ahead and move right on to uh, Maracas. Um, and it looks, it looks like you can, yeah, I don't, see any, I don't see any questions coming in, so it looks like you have blown everyone's mind, Jeremy. I think you okay. can, I think you can <laughs> actually <laughs> move to Maracas. All right, I'm gonna move. Great. Great. Um, speaking of which, we, uh, I hope the bachata in, on my street is not too loud, but uh, if you can't beat him, join him. So here we go. Uh, it's, it sounds cool. Uh, you're in, and it's New York City, man. It's like it's Great. Add, adding to Great. the a Atmospheric. So I um, want to talk about Maracas really quick. The main thing, I mean, of course, um, maybe some of you know, I uh, also play a very specific style of Maraca playing from Venezuela, uh, which is definitely its own class. But um, this time, again, for thinking of Pops concerts and stuff like that, um, I just want to share two ways to do this standard um, bolero pattern and then also talk a little bit about how to just do general articulation stuff like we were talking about with the shakers um, so basically same kind of thing we want to have non accented notes and accented notes that's almost all of drumming right um, so we want to figure out how to do that so first of all I have these nice um, nice guys here um, I kind of hold in like a American grip. It's not really thumbs up, and it's definitely not this. Um, seen seen people do this, and for me that doesn't. It's uh, I'm fighting a little bit of gravity because I actually want I actually want to be able to move them and snap them with my fingers, like this. So this way, I don't get any help from gravity if I'm uh, holding it in this sort of German grip. So a nice kind of in between is good American grip. And for the, this, we want to have this like snapping motion to get that accent. So when I go down, I'm actually going snap with my, with my fingers. And then very important, I'm releasing immediately after. So I'm very loose. I come up, and then, and I'm loose up here. This is also really important. I'm still loose up here. And then I can go snap like this at the, at the bottom. Um, it's also something worth practicing to get this upstroke clean. This is what I mean by up, this one. Again, that's just timing, timing of kind of following it and releasing like this instead of, right? It's not that, I'm just, it's more synergistic with the following it up here like that. Easier said than done, but hopefully you can see it and kind of mimic that. So with my other hand, this is the motion that we're gonna be dealing with. And I want to be able to do two ways, especially as a orchestral or chamber musician. If I'm in a salsa, salsa band, um, I will probably never need really to be like uh, super articulate with every note because the whole the style is um, part of the sound is to have uh, this took me a little while to realize part of the sound is actually to have the sort of a loose sound with these accents so for example this is what i mean by sort of um not totally articulated sound so um
So you can see their their you can hear the accents are clear, but in between is kind of just and that is totally fine in some in some cases. So um, someone like me coming from a drumline background, you know, I always want to be, everything has to be really clean. But uh, no, not not all the all the time. So sometimes that's the sound, especially you know in a big orchestra that would sound great, like fill up the sound uh, if it's again in that style. But um, if I want to control all the articulation, da, 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 now I really have to work in moving precisely back and forth this way. And the action that's happening is, again, I'm going ba, 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 ba. The, the loosening is just as important as the snap, especially in this back to be, to be loose there. Otherwise, what I did earlier, you'll get like that, the sort of da da. Right. So in order to be, in order to stop the motion uh, smoothly, you gotta release. Then you can snap forward. So main thing about that again is this coordination. Da 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 da. Now uh, to this bolero pattern. Da 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 da. I want to show you two ways. One is with right hand lead and the right hand does almost everything and the left hand just kind of follows. So with the right hand, I'm going to go. Notice again, watch the, the gears like I talked about before. So here with the arm and then the small notes with articulated with the wrist. Notice I'm still moving up and down and not just doing this, but that's really important. The reason why that's important is it's going to give us nice phrasing and it's also going to give us better articulation, more fluid flow. We're, get, we're working against gravity if we just go like this. It's not even. I need to use gravity a little bit this way and that way. Another reason that's really important is that same technique can be slowed down. So if I just go like this, how would I do that going da 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 da? Yeah, but it's really, it's not articulate, right? So I can go That's going to give me a lot more better rhythmic integrity and articulation. So that motion just gets smaller. Then you have this fast uh, figure. And then after that, you just continue shaking. So that's good if you have to, first of all, if you have to play with one hand, that's, that's a great way to do it. If not the way to do it. Um, and it, and simply if I want to keep doing that and then join with my other hand, all I'm doing is back and forth like this. So that coordination of da, 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 da. Rather, uh, 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 um, that making sure that these notes are together. Um, the more traditional way, like I would if I was in a salsa band, is actually 
left hand lead, but the right hand is doing the ornament, and it's going to be a little bit different. This, even if I was in an orchestra, orchestral situation playing a really kind of slow bolero or something, I would choose this one. I feel like it's a little more three dimensional sounding because it's something something about it goes back and forth between the hands a little bit better instead of just right right hand only. Um, so this one, I'm actually doing the downbeats on my left. And then the ornament is a little bit tricky. It takes some getting used to. Um, I would go da, 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 da. So I'll do that a little bit more so you can see it. Um, the end of that kind of triplet figure, it's tricky because it ends back. So. Oops, I did it wrong. It's so slow, it's hard. Um. Like that. Da 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 da. Da 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 da. Da 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 da. Da 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 da. It's it's pretty tricky and a little counterintuitive, but here's how it sounds full speed. Um, I just want to show you, I'll do that pattern and show you the difference between uh, the sort of loose articulation and the strict articulation. Um, take a listen. Kind of up and down motion. Now if I want more strict articulation on the inner notes, then I go back to our shaker motion, which is more like this. All right, so watch the difference. Hear the difference? I'll go back to the salsa version. And I'm also phrasing it as well. I can delay a little bit. Uh, to get that phrasing. Another uh, cool thing that I did, I came up with this when I played last year with the LA Philharmonic, which was really special. Um, I was playing maracas and uh, it was for... Um, a beautiful uh, bolero piece at a pops concert and I came up with this which was kind of a long it was very slow so I was trying to think of a nice way to do it um, when I do this pattern I'm still gonna hey, do left hand lead hey Jeremy yes could you just take one step further back from the mic it's just it's maxing out just oh. slightly oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, when I'm doing this pattern, instead of keeping this perpetual motion, I stop a little bit on my right side, so I stop here instead of stopping here. So I go one, I leave my right hand down, then I can go, I can use that as the first note, and then I can go one, two, three, four, five. So it's actually like a quintuplet uh, ornament. So one, two, three. Um, something like that. Mm. doing it I was trying to do it kind of mathematically precise but if I phrased it it sounds something like this
Let me know if you got that. Uh, so that's the quintuplet sort of bolero pattern. Um, yeah, maracas. Uh, we can talk about kashishi really quick, or should we just do questions? Yeah, let's, questions? let's let's do maybe like a just a simple overview of kashishi five five ten minutes um, or just five minutes, and then we'll do, we'll open it up to the questions. Awesome. Yeah, really quick, uh, all the same mechanics apply, right? So um, all of these principles are, are the same with Kashishi. Uh, now we have this added element we can play with the gourd bottom here. So my default with Kashishi is the basket only. We want to angle it depending on our instrument, we want to angle it a little bit so that we're not getting a half, like. So if we want basket only, angle it a little bit. And then simply for the accents, I turn my wrist out. And then for the other accent, I can turn all the way back in towards me. It takes a little bit of flexibility to get all the way totally facing toward you and then the accent comes here for that. Then it can be tricky to really precisely switch back to this neutral position. And as quickly as I can, I go back here immediately for the backstroke. So boom, and immediately I'm back perpendicular. So between each accent, which I'm turning like this, I'm making sure that I'm in that neutral position. So it's a little bit of a coordination to go out perpendicular, this way, set perpendicular, out. Um, same thing applied to two Kashishi, excuse me for a second. With two, it's a similar thing with maracas, right? We want this coordinated back and forth motion and you can do cool accent patterns, um, alternating accents like this, just making sure that in between it's neutral. So it's switching back between like this or in back, back. These kind of things. Um, yeah, that's not much special about that. Just mainly is just resetting back to the neutral position. What do you think? How are we doing? Awesome. Hey, hey guys, uh, this is Steven here. I'm just popping in. Um, hope you guys have enjoyed the class. Um, thank you, Jeremy, so much uh, for all of your knowledge, sharing all of that with us. And uh, yeah, we definitely want to open it up. Uh, feel free to type anything into the Q and A. Uh, raise your hand. Uh, we also have the ability to let you um, <clears throat> like speak through your mic as well. Um, so just let us know if you have any questions. And uh, yeah, we'll have we'll have some time here at the end for that. We have a question coming here from Kishaya. Have you ever played with Shaker Ray? And if you did, what is the difference between that and the Shaker technique? <laughs> yeah, uh, I have played shaker. Um, it's very different because you're holding a big, <laughs> holding a big uh, bulbous, loud thing. Uh, there's a lot to control, but uh, I, I hope it's helpful to say that the same principles of we were talking about, you know, just like using gravity to your advantage, kind of using these down strokes. So, for example. Remember how I was saying that the shaker is not totally per perpendicular or parallel to the floor. It's actually more of angled following the shape of your arm and getting help with gravity going down and then lifting back up to get that accent. It's the same thing. Shaker ray to get accent down and then throwing it up. It's really like a throwing and catching 
like this. If this image is helpful with my wrists, it's really this kind of thing. Da 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 to get accents like that. So the same, uh, you know, we're working with the same same physics, fortunately. Awesome. And, and guys, this is a great opportunity just to um, announce to everyone on the stream that Stephen is our events manager, which is a very awesome thing. Stephen will be helping out uh, in lots of different ways with hosting and with uh, scheduling, coordinating lots of these live events. Um, and he is just being an absolute all-star and has been extraordinarily, he is instrumental in the process of us moving forward as a company. So we are, we are very, very happy to have him on board doing what he's doing. Um, uh, I've, got, I've got some questions for you, Jeremy. I'll, I'll ask these ones. And then guys, as, you, uh, as you're listening along, please at any time, Send in a question through the Q&A or, um, or raise your hand if you want to, you're welcome to ask it in person. If you want to ask Jeremy a question in person, or if you have an instrument and you want to play something, you know, if you have your shaker right here and you're ready to go and you want to play, you can play for Jeremy and we can invite you to be a panelist. All you have to do is raise your hand and we will do that. Okay, so Jeremy, do you ever find yourself... Um, we talked a little bit of, kind of about this, but not specifically this. Do you ever find yourself needing to change technique for a tempo shift? Like if you're playing along, has this ever happened to you? You're playing along with the band and things start to like drastically change in the tempo, or maybe there's actually like a written tempo that has changed. Is, is, is there anything happen with your technique or does it just stay exactly how you've showed us in the class where maybe like it, it just means you're going to lengthen your arm because now it's slower or how do you approach this? Let's see. I'm trying to think of, of cases. I mean, one thing I think of is when, if it's really fast, there's only, you know, you lose a little bit of control. So, um, I'm trying to think of say that, what if I had to do something really fast? Like, Yeah, I'm trying to think of what's going on there. I, I'm definitely using more muscles. I have to, you know, tighten my, like, really engaging my bicep, I feel. If I'm still trying to get an accent, I'm still trying to loosen my grip as much as possible without throwing it. Um, so that's a big thing, is even if I'm playing... I'm, 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 I'm tight here because this is the, the, what's working really hard, mm. not tight, but this is very active, but I'm trying to loosen up as much as possible. Cause that's going to give the articulation at the very top, like the, like a molar, it's almost like a molar thing. Like at the very end is when I can get that speed. So the articulation is actually can help me just by being loose. Then it's a little more supple to, ah. And I can also do those accents like that a little bit, almost like a molar thing, like no. keep, by keeping my, my wrist loose. And, and that kind of leads, leads into the second question of, um, you know, you're talking about molar, you're talking about earlier, like two fingers versus three versus four, like the, and the grip. Do you ever alter the grip on purpose, not because of a technique reason, but for a sound reason? Like, cause I know with this shaker here, like if I, if I very much grip it, I can sort of intentionally muffle it. And I, I didn't really see you do that much, actually. You were always just going for like a very beautiful, open, full sound. So I'm curious if that ever comes up where you, like with an egg shaker, you need to muffle for a reason. No, that's great. I mean, not often, but definitely, especially like if you, maybe you were in a close mic situation and you were there, you were playing as softly as you could with an egg shaker. Yeah. And they were like, oh, it's maybe it's a little too bright. And I'm like, okay, yeah, maybe. That can be a nice sound. It kind of sounds like this. Yeah. You know, that, that's a great, great thing. And um, how about um, you, when you said before about, you, we were talking about instrument choice, you said uh, that it, it's a very important that you give a lot of, time and consideration to choosing the instrument. So what are some of the things that go into that? Like if you're in the orchestra and the part just says shakers, which happens to me every time I play shakers, right? Never says what type of shakers, almost yeah. extremely rare to have it say 
Kashishi or to have it say Shaker Ray or whatever. I mean, it's it's always Shakers for a pop chart. So do you ever do you ever have something where it says Shakers and you might play a different instrument or you might play a very specific type of Shaker? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'll I'll repeat uh, what I said before in that truly this guy that I made with the, the small, yeah. really small beads. I mean, it sounds good every time, but if this one probably would not be loud enough in a full orchestra. So that would that would I would need something bigger, probably maybe I don't know, but um, bigger. But if I want the same sound, you know, uh, I have to search for that because this a lot of commercial shakers, I feel like are not filled enough, I think. Mm. And they're just sort of loose. Yes. I don't know. They're, like, I'm just thinking of those big rhythm tech ones. Um, yeah, there, I just wish there was more in there. There's just, there's too much moving around. Like, you, you get also, when you have the right amount of filling, mm -hmm. you get a little bit of added control because it's, it's there's not so much moving around inside. Um, what else? What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, I think that's a very good, that, that's cool. a very good answer. Um, do you ever find the need to use the, and we're not, this is not like a dig on anybody's brand. If anybody sees this and you make the shaker, but the mm -hmm. one shot shakers, you know, like the intentionally single sided shaker, I've, I've found use for those in a recording setting, um, outside of the recording setting. Do you use those? Would you ever use those in some sort of ensemble? Um, or is it, or are those always limited to recording sessions for you? Um, I don't have any. I've, I've never used them. I'm, I'm thinking about getting some of the small ones that get on go on your fingers. That's kind of cool. I've seen some like yeah. hybrid percussionists use that, and they just have like a shaker sound in the background, but it's really on their fingers. Um, as far as the one shots, I mean, I I if I had to play single notes, I would do kind of what we said before, like mm. instead of going dot 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 dot. But yeah, that's fine. It's just it's just another instrument option. I mean, they it's a certain sound, you know. It doesn't sound like a shaker, if I remember right. I haven't heard them in a while, but right. it sounds just like a tick. Yeah, they're very. Art I mean, it's not. They're yeah. awesome for just a couple things. I mean, they're they're very useful. They're clearly useful. But I was curious if you had if you had ever seen them used in like sort of that way. Oh, do you? Right, you oh, you, you got them. Oh, that sounds way better than I thought it did. Those are cool. Hey, yeah, I, these these are the small ones, not the full size ones. So that's that's cool. I mean, it's different. I've been curious about that because it's it is like you know, it, for one, it like eliminates all tech, pretty much all necessary. <laughs> yeah. Right. But also, I mean, it, it's just a different. It's a different sound because it's two forward motions as opposed. Yeah. To, uh huh. And it it just inherently that changes everything immediately so yeah that's why yeah, yeah i mean that that would that that's a great point is that it it again if you want that then great but if right. it it could also take away some nice phrasing of back and forth back and forth you know right. this kind of like you know that's kind of nice with when it's like instead of just like you know it also takes away a hand. I mean, obviously, it's a, then you need two hands in order to do that. Oh, that's true. That's well. It's the, there's a disadvantage there. Then, yeah. <laughs> How uh, was it to solo? I mean, you just mentioned that it was really special to play with L.A. Phil. What was it like to play with the Boston Symphony on maracas? I mean, when I saw that go on your resume, I was just like, "What is going on? Like, this is." <laughs> Amazing, you know, like this guy I went to school with is like he is totally self-made. Like teaching him everything, like teaching himself everything on YouTube, and then like going, just going to salsa sessions, going to this club, going to this place, and just learning it, just learning everything. And I'm sure you had teachers too, but I mean, a lot of stuff was self-taught. And yeah. now you're playing maracas with the Boston Symphony. <laughs> so, I mean, what, what was that like? Like, what was the trajectory of getting to Boston, actually playing there, and like sort of the buildup of like learning? on your own about this um as far as learning on my own it was a a good example of kind of 
my approach to everything, which is like get the technique out of the way as soon as possible, like spend as much time as needed just to learn how the instrument works, how to play the instrument. Okay. And then, and then, you know, go whichever genre you want. And in that case, by the time I got that part, I had spent so much time. So this, this was a very specific piece called, <laughs> can't remember it, but it was, it's by a Venezuelan composer. It's with two vocalists and orchestra and choir. It's a big piece. Yeah. And it was by a Venezuelan composers and it had direct like, uh, folkloric Venezuelan yes. music style in it. And so this was like a, this is a Joropo Maraca part. Like this was not a shaker part. This was okay. a Venezuelan Maraca part. Yeah. So, uh, because Kyle knew that I played, um, I was on the short list. They were trying to get somebody else and then they couldn't do it. And so I was <laughs> the next guy on the line, I guess. Wow. And, um, so I, I was able to do it. And so my point being just that the technique was already was already done but it was really cool to have to orchestrate it and of course i looked at as many videos and stuff as i as i could um but i really i came up with my own version um which i was really proud of yeah. it was a mix of kind of like the things we were i've mentioned before it was a mix of like okay this is with the flutes so i want to be like really kind of conservative and clear and clean like like an orchestral percussionist mm -hmm. and then this section is my time and i'm playing maracas like you know and i loosened up a little bit improvised a little bit you know within you know musical taste but um so that was cool to learn how to do that and there was some also notation which you know if i did this class part two you know we would go through actual parts i would love to do that go through actual parts and say, this is how you can orchestrate this kind of stuff. Do you do two notes forward or do you do two notes back? And how do you, you know, just like stickings on a snare drum, it's the same thing with shakers. Like, how do you, okay, I'm up, I'm up here, uh, but I need to do a brush. So how do I get the, how do I get down? You know, so I need to end down so I can, you know, it's the same kind of thing. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was, it was that. And then one thing, um, that I've learned plenty of other places, but uh, definitely learned there was, I wanted to mention definitely to your crowd, is the importance of learning how to kind of play behind the beat enough to, mm. to be able to push forward as needed. So mm. if, you get, if you're too forward all the time, then uh, it's just it's sort of rhythmic sandpaper um but just remember that you can always go faster immediately yeah and slowing down is like really awkward uh yeah um i learned the same thing in tennis as well you always stand back because you can always move forward quicker than mm -hmm. than than you move back so that's another general thing um is kind of learning how to just be in a solid place kind of ready to to move forward or anything but if not just kind of blending in and, and driving right in the middle uh, and not trying to fight too much. There was, it was difficult to, cause I was used to like, Un, do, <laughs> and then the piano player, you know, bless his heart. He was just sort of like reading the chart. Like, I'm like, man, let's go. <laughs> like, you know, so it was an orchestra. So they weren't like playing in a club. So it was different kind of, um adjusting to their time i really had to do that i really had to lay back as much as possible while still being like here it is folks like let's go you know um so yeah uh yeah, that would that sense. that piece happen to have been saint mark's passion the goalie home <laughs> no. no no okay um, that was a that was a piece that was done by the bso when i was in graduate school in boston and involved a huge folkloric ensemble, congas and all sorts of hand drums and stuff like that. But must have been a different, must have been a different thing from what you did. Yeah, gosh, um, I can't think of the composer right now or the title. Fine. No, don't worry. After the class, we'll go and find it, and we'll uh, yeah. we'll put it in the comments for when people are watching the video. Awesome. No hey, um, Jeremy. Speaking of uh, speaking of maracas, a question that I had for you: um, something that comes up in orchestral music a good amount. 
Um, the piece I'm thinking of off the top of my head uh, for some of you classical guys in here is uh, the, the Taranga Lila Symphony by Messian has a pretty pr uh, prominent maraca part. Um, and a lot of the part, there's a lot of times where he calls for roles. So, um, and we always, I've seen lots of people attempt different things and it's usually medium to medium bad, myself included. Um, so I'm just wondering like, um, you know, if you saw that notated in a maraca part, especially by, you know, like a French kind of postmodern composer, yeah. uh, you know, it's not stylistically, you know, Latin in any sense. Um, what you would like, what kind of technique you would go to, to perform a maraca role? Yeah. Um, great. Um, there's this upside down one, which is probably common swirl. Um, the Venezuelan version is just right side up and it's kind of just going in a circle. Um, and you can, you can get it pretty smooth, especially if you have nice maracas. Um, that kind of thing or like that there we go would you use both hands at the same time to accomplish the same sort of thing oh yeah that's good yeah totally you can do this and you know you you can you can do like this but if you want to almost like a snare drum roll if you want to try and uh, have it get the seams out of there, as we say. Um, you know, you can learn how to do different speeds. That kind of thing, you know, going a little bit faster with my right hand. Um, yeah, I would, I would try the, for some reason, when I go outside, so count with my right hand um, clockwise, uh, for some reason that smooths things out really, really nicely, as opposed to going Zuz, 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 zuz. When I go this way, I can do that. There's um, a really loud roll, so I definitely did that a lot in this piece that we were talking about with the BSO. But then there's also a Venezuelan style, which is like I'm holding it like this, and then I do this doorknob thing. So that, if if I wanted to do fortissimo like that I would do something like this kind of and I'm loose losing loose loosening my wrist so it's kind of going like flop like this it's not it's not tight like this it's kind of like it almost ends up looking like a figure eight almost yeah it's like a tambourine roll yeah I was about to say it's actually like kind of surprising <laughs> That's probably maxing out the mic like crazy, but um, <laughs> probably similar to that idea where you're the more loose you can be both in your elbow and your wrist it leads to m more sound just and, and a more consistently yeah. full sound. Yeah. Yeah. Jeremy, can you uh, crescendo and decrescendo on that technique as well? Is that a th that's something that comes up too? It's like, oh, great. A crescendo maraca roll. <laughs> How would that work? <laughs> Yeah, I guess you could connect them. I guess you could you could start here. I mean, that, yeah, <laughs> that's my uh, estimation. But other than that, I mean, I mean, that's that's what I would do. That's a technique that I know. I'm trying to think of another way to do it. I mean, do people just swirl mostly? Yeah, I've seen. I mean, the like way I, ways I've done it and seen it done is like just them both going like this like sticks in the oh, air oh that seems like a bad idea and then at the yeah at a loud dynamic it's just like brrrr, like yeah. it's yeah it's not smooth at all yeah um, let me see um let me see what it sounds like with the, some big guys i love how like absolutely flawless that first on demand attempt was just like, yeah. if you think about it roll perfect yeah. loud roll return like it just completely seamless that's ridiculous <laughs> Yeah. That's really loud in here. 
Um, it's with a big salsa maraca, but it's the same thing. I'm just kind of grabbing it like a torch. <laughs> uh, and then doing this, like, yeah, yeah. this, this kind of thing. Um, if you look at cumbia maraca playing, you'll get some tips. Cumbia from Colombia. Okay. They yeah. go, this kind of thing. Um, Yeah, so that would be my like fortissimo, and then probably I would go down to. You can even because you can even get one bead kind of. That's nice, right? Yeah, I haven't done that in a while. Uh, I got excited. This is a good time to mention, because um, uh, we are now starting a, a bit to push towards the end of the class. So it's a good time After to hours. that um, Mr. Jeremy, uh, our, our, it's a question, I have to make sure. Are you available for private lessons? Yes. Okay, so Mr. Jeremy is available for private lessons. You can contact him through his Instagram, through his website through uh, his direct email, which we can share with you uh, if you message us privately. Um, so if you guys are interested in getting more one-on-one -on -one attention or a deep dive on any specific thing, please know that Jeremy is available. And in general, um, if you're interested in lessons with any of our artists, that they are available to you um, for private lessons. We can always ask them to, to arrange something for you. Um, I definitely know that Steven and I are also available for all sorts of stuff. Most of the time we'll help you for free, but if you want to have like a, a full on session about career building or about lessons, um, we are, we are here to assist you in your journey to becoming professional percussionists. And, and I very much hope that today's class being hundred percent free is also helping everyone on their mission to become a little bit better at something today with these shakers uh it's it's a shakers are it's a big topic you know there's a lot of instruments to play percussion in general there's a lot of instruments to play so we're going to be offering these classes to try to just demonstrate as much as we can as much value and actual playing as we possibly mm -hmm. can do we'll also do some talks as well um because the mental space is important but we're going to try to focus on really getting people um in a place where they feel like every time they come to watch these classes, it's just like what today was with Jeremy, where you're getting just raw technique. Like, hey, if you practice this, you'll be good to go. That's so important to uh, mm -hmm. our mission uh, about about you know making world class percussionists like Jeremy to accessible for everyone because uh, it's uh, not always easy to do. Jeremy's time is limited. Uh, it's expensive to take private lessons, so that's that's why we are doing these classes. Um, Jeremy, I'm, uh, if you have any final thoughts and final thoughts from the panel, please, everybody ask your question. The time is now because we are wrapping up. Um, but I'm sure Stephen might have a few last things to ask. My, my biggest thing for, for everyone in the audience is just, you know, because you are so self-taught, um, not uh, that's how I view you. As I've seen you do so much on your own. You're such an advocate of like, I'm just gonna figure that out. I'm gonna listen. I'm gonna listen to a recording. I'm gonna watch this guy play and I'm just gonna figure it out on my own. Wh what have been some of your biggest musical influences that you might want to share for these instruments for everyone who's watching for further study after this class? Yeah, I mean, uh, the obvious, the all too obvious answer for me is the, I would just say the Venezuelan uh, and Colombian Musica Llanera from the plains. It's basically cowboy music from Colombia and Venezuela. Um, but when I first heard maracas do what they do, uh, I was completely smitten and just like, I went crazy. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I just, it, cause it just, it, it kept getting more and more satisfying. Like, oh, I didn't think maracas could do that. And then learning one thing like, oh, but if I learned how to do double strokes that would be really good and then you know whatever and then you know just all these ornaments with shaking and brushing and the you know there's so many different sounds and it's very choreographic it's very visual as well which is fascinating and so a lot spell, of times could you spell that first musica is m-u-s-i-c-a 
I'm gonna move my mic. You can probably still hear me though. Uh, can I put it in the chat? You can put it right in the chat. That's where I was gonna put it for you. Yeah. Some keywords are horopo and musica yanera. Um. Yes. And oh, um, also cumbia, cumbia from Colombia. Guys, I'm I'm copying. Jeremy, you're sending them to the panelists. I'm going to copy and paste Oops. what you just said. It's okay. Right. I got it for you. I'm going to copy and paste and send those to all our attendees. So, guys, it, you can see there I just wrote down Joropo, Musica, Llanera, and Cumbia from Colombia are Jeremy's recommendations uh, for, for some further study and for some uh, enlightenment. And if you mm. want to get smitten, <laughs> which is a great word yeah. for that. Um, uh, Stephen, do you do you have some do you have some closing thoughts, some closing questions for Jeremy? No, I think uh, this is fantastic. I just want to say thanks to Jeremy and thanks for uh, to all of you guys who uh, joined in and listened to the class. Um, we're gonna have more of these coming down the pipeline very soon. Um, so you know, keep an eye out, um, watch our uh, social media and the website for more announcements. And uh, yeah, again, thanks so much, Jeremy. This was great to learn from you. And we look forward to more. Awesome. Yeah, it's it's really uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to have you on. And uh, we've got Sam, we've got Samuel Chan. I know he won't mind if I shout him out. Who says <laughs> thanks, Jeremy and Josh and Stephen in parentheses? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks so much for being here, Jeremy. And and guys, um, you know, uh, we hope to have Jeremy back if he'll be on board with us. And please do let us know who else uh, that you guys would like to see. It's very important that um, we are finding the people that you guys want to hear from on the instruments you want to hear from, on the topics you want to hear from. So uh, if you guys have other things, I mean, Jeremy can play like, I don't know, 4,000 instruments, whatever. But, but, but he's pretty pro at at least six or seven like serious topics like with deep dive discussion where he could do a, probably a whole course on multiple things so if there are certain things that you want to see from jeremy in the future uh please do let us know and we will set up a class with him on that definitely uh, but yeah i just i wanted to say because i i'm sort of i see steven and josh but i know uh other people are here so i just want to say thanks for thanks for everybody for tuning in sticking around really appreciate it awesome all right, guys. Well, that concludes it for the day. And um, to everyone saying great match class, thank you. Looking forward to more. We really, really appreciate it. To Manuel, to Kishaya, to Lexter. Guys, thank you so much for being here. It, it really means the world to us. Um, and if, if, this class, if this class did bring you any value at all, please know that you can reach out to us. Um, and there are many ways to get involved in terms of donations. And you can also, if you want to pick up some swag in the store, that goes directly to our Percussion Conservatory Scholarship Fund, which is advancing education for young percussionists. And all of you who are here in attendance uh, by the end of today will receive a free gift from the conservatory in your email inboxes. So please check for that. And guys, that is the class. This has been how to play shakers in the orchestra with Jeremy Smith. Thank you so much. And, uh, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Jeremy. We really, we really, really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Take care guys. Have a great day, everybody. Morning, noon or night, wherever you are. Bye-bye.